Everyone's making a big deal about the Dutch farmer protests online right now. It's not hard to drop onto social media and see posts like this. You'll never see this photo of Dutch farmers on your TV. And to be fair, yeah, it's a pretty striking photo. You've got the highway lined up with tractors throughout the entire shot. It's very symmetrical, and the colors are pretty good. This looks like one of those photos that could be considered historic down the line. Of course, the rightoids are there to push their narrative. Rebel media is interviewing people, both farmers who believe that the government ultimately wants their land, and is using the current legislation as a way to bully them out, to former police officers who are more than willing to discuss what will happen if the farmer protests continue. Dutch farmers are saying no to the Great Reset and climate communism is a pretty good headline if you want your post to go viral within rightist circles. And to their credit, we are seeing arrests of the protesters by the police. Even one shooting by the police that ended up with one person injured and thankfully nobody dead. But this is the right wing's dream come true. The whole thing fits into their anti-globalist Klaus Schwab narrative. Here's the TLDR of these protests as I understand them. In 2019, the government of the Netherlands announced that their country was in a nitrogen emission crisis. The Netherlands is the second largest exporter of food in the world after the US. And this huge amount of food production has led to nitrogen emissions that are destroying the very soil the food is grown in, let alone the rest of the environment. The Dutch National Institute for Public Health and the Environment, otherwise known as the RIVM, the acronym makes sense in Dutch, released a study showing that 46% of the Netherlands nitrogen emissions come from the agricultural sector, a good chunk of that being from cows. And so the government intends to put a hard cap on farm emissions. The farmers, in reply, said that those numbers were off, and that the government has an incentive to blame the farmers for the emissions, because tackling the actual cause was too hard. Another large source of nitrogen emissions is power plants, and to a lesser extent, exhaust from cars. At the end of the day, in order to tackle the nitrogen problem, the government was going to have to take on either the farmers, the car manufacturers, or big energy, and the government chose the farmers. Or alternatively, you could also continue to develop technology that prevents nitrogen emission or cleans it up afterwards, which the Netherlands is already doing, because the study shows a 30% decrease between 2005 and 2018, despite the increased production, but let's, uh, let's forget about that. And maybe some rightoids don't want to admit it, but nitrogen emission is actually a real problem. Large parts of the Netherlands are naturally nitrogen-low biomes like bogs that are slowly getting encroached on by nitrogen-loving forest plants like shrubs and grass. This change will lead to an extinction of some types of herbs and flowers, which in turn will lead to an extinction of some types of bugs that feed off of those plants, which in turn will lead to an extinction of some types of birds that feed off those bugs. Nitrogen runoff into the water causes a massive burst of algae growth, which can be toxic to a lot of local marine life. The environmental concern isn't exactly fake news here. These things have a snowballing effect that can absolutely come back to bite us in the ass in unforeseen ways. But it's not just nitrogen concerns. Another large part of it is the rise of animal rights activists in the Netherlands. Yeah, believe it or not, these hippies have actually managed to get some sway within Dutch politics. What ultimately kicked off these protests back in 2019 was 200 of these people illegally occupying a pig farm. It was this event that caused the farmers to organize into activist collectives, the most prominent one being the Farmer Defense Force. And it's been these organizations that have gathered up these protests on behalf of the country's farmers. They're almost like an informal farmers union engaging in a general strike. The protests have been on and off ever since then, but in the English-speaking world, we're really only hearing about them now because on June 10th, 2022, despite three years of protests and negotiations, the government has ultimately gone ahead with its plan. They've designated 24.3 billion euros to the implementation of agricultural reforms that aim to halve nitrogen emissions by 2030 and close approximately 30% of the farms in the Netherlands. These actions have led to all of those viral videos and photos of farmers blocking roads and the empty store shelves that you see on social media right now. And the right is all over covering these events while the left is strangely silent. That's not even pushing back, you know? Usually they'll call the right-wingers climate deniers and racists, but this time they're just acting like they don't even know what's happening at all. Maybe they don't. It's not like they pay attention to what the right is doing. But as your local centrist fence sitter, I do actually pay attention to what everyone's doing as much as I can. And I am reminded of a similar situation, the farmer protests in India. India, like the Netherlands, produces more than enough food to feed its population. However, unlike the Netherlands, India still faces a hunger problem. Part of the reason why is because farming isn't as efficient there, and neither is their distribution network. In 2004, then Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, said, we need a second green revolution, making use of modern advances. Advances. For that, we need to revitalize India's research agricultural system, India's extension system, India's credit system. The more we commercialize our agriculture, the more our farmers need access to commercial inputs, and that was a modernization of our agriculture credit system. There are other rigidities because of the whole marketing regime set up in the 1930s, which prevent our farmers from selling their produce, 
where they get the highest rate of return. It is our intention to remove all of these handicaps, which come in the way of India realizing its vast potential as one large common market. Singh is referring to the Mandi system set up by India's Agricultural Produce Market Committee. Mandis are specialized government-run marketplaces where produce is sold via auction, and they are the only place that farmers are allowed to sell their produce in India. This system was set up first by the colonial government, and then continued after India's independence from the UK, because their rulers recognized that India was in a fragile state. In order to not simply become a consumer nation of other nations' products, government intervention would be required to protect local production until it got on its feet and was able to compete in a global marketplace. The Mandi system continued for nearly 100 years. In 2020, the current Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, spoke on the need for India to get rid of the Mandi system. His government passed three bills, colloquially known as the Farm Bills. The first one allowed farmers to sell their produce anywhere. The second one allowed for contract farming between a farmer and the buyer of his produce. The third one allowed for the regulation of production in times of extreme need. In response, throughout late 2020 until November of 2021, there was a massive general strike by India's farmers, who had grown accustomed to the protection that the regulation of the Mandi system provided them. Additionally, the farmers also didn't want the government to have the power to regulate their production. Tens of thousands of farmers, driving their tractors and riding their horses, protested by blocking highways into and out of Delhi. Police arrested the protesters. Protesters broke through barricades. Police and the farmers clashed, leading to many injuries and deaths. This continued for months, until in November of 2021, Modi repealed the three farm bills. While this was happening, I don't recall seeing many right-leaning people talking about it. But the left? Oh man, every bread tuber, every shitty prog streamer, every terminally online verified account was talking about this. About how this was the socialist praxis in action, how the working class was rising up against the bourgeoisie in India, despite none of them knowing a single fucking thing that was going on or anything about India's politics. It's not hard to see the parallels though, is it? In both cases, the government decided to fuck with farmers. The farmers organized and unionized and engaged in a general strike, stopping not only their own production, but shutting down other segments of society because their demands were not being met. And the English speaking world, foreign to both events, only had something to say about it when it fit their specific narrative. Rightoids ignored the India protests, just like the leftoids are ignoring the Dutch protests. And it's because Prime Minister Modi is the leader of India's right-wing party, while the Dutch farmers are protesting a left-wing government. To be clear, I'm not only saying that people are specifically ignoring it for partisan reasons. I'm sure that happens, but it's not the only factor. I'm also saying that if you don't have an ideological predisposition to support the protests, they're not even going to hit your social media feed. This is just a hunch, but I bet a lot of right-leaning people probably never even heard a peep about the India protests. It just never hit their radar. And the same thing's probably happening to left-leaning people right now over the Netherlands. Also, if you want another parallel, it's funny as fuck that in both instances, the government was labeled as fascist. In India, because of Modi's unapologetically pro-India stance, and in the Netherlands, because because of the government's seeming desire to turn his workforce into serfs. There's a wider trend here, though. For example, here in Canada, Trudeau has quietly announced that his government wants to pursue the same policies as in the Netherlands, and farmers are already preparing to protest. Farmers already took part in the blockade as part of the Ottawa trucker protest, yes, that's still coming, which was another working-class general strike against government action. A couple of online socialists who still retain a few brain cells, like Shu, for example, was dismayed at the broader left's reaction to the trucker protest, saying, do leftists cheering this on understand that Canada isn't freezing the bank accounts of protesters because they're fascists or whatever, but that they are freezing them because the convoy is now threatening capital? What do you think a general strike would be like? And she was correct. For all of the socialist bluster about the proletariat's revolt, when it actually happens, the socialists scream about how the truckers and the farmers aren't actually the proletariat. The revolt of the workers was actually a fascist insurrection against them, and that they needed to be at the least dispersed, and better yet, forced back to work, producing the goods and services that the left requires of them. Another event going viral right now is the massive protests in the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, with dramatic footage of the presidential palace being stormed January 6th style. And yes, it is real socialism. All you have to do is examine their economic policies recently. Since 2010, Sri Lanka has taken on enormous amounts of debt, primarily from China. The government tried to spend its way out of the crisis, and did so by cutting taxes and printing a shit ton of money. In this, it directly ignored the advice of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. You know that thing that socialists claim is the arm of neoliberal colonialism that rolls into the third world and liberalizes their economies and turns them into capitalist surf states? Well, that same IMF advised Sri Lanka to stop printing so much money. Sri Lanka said, fuck you, I'm socialist, I'll do what I want, and then they basically destroyed their economy. But more interesting for the purposes of this video is that Sri Lanka also banned non-organic farming, and in doing so also banned most types of fertilizer. There was an instant loss of tea production, costing the country $425 million. Within six months, the country was producing 20% less rice, and transitioned from being self-sufficient in food production to having to import food at a cost of $450 million. As expected, the farmers started to revolt and organize. You've heard the story before. The government's response was to simply print more money and pay the farmers off with it, which didn't exactly work. 
So the question remains, what is it with governments trying to fuck with farmers? Maybe governments just innately fear them. There's that old saying that every society is a few weeks away from collapse or something, referencing the fact that if food stops making it from farm to store to table, no amount of bribery or force will keep a population from overthrowing its government or die trying. Though maybe it's something a little bit deeper than that. We all know about the kulaks at this point, don't we? Well, here's the story anyway, for completionist's sake. In the Soviet Union, Russian farmers were divided into three classes. Bednyaks, the poor peasants. Serednyaks, the medium-income peasants. And kulaks, the high-income peasants. By high income, the socialists meant that their farms had at least eight acres of land. Just so you can visualize it, one acre is just under half of a baseball field. So if you had four baseball fields worth of land, you were a high income peasant by Soviet standards. During the final years of the Russian Empire, the Stjolpin reform was implemented. This was a liberalization of the Russian agricultural economy, where peasants were able to gradually come to own their own farms by paying off the old noble landowner class, which they were once serfs of, using a monthly portion of their farm earnings. Though there were differences in quality of land, it's generally recognized as historical fact that the Stiopian system allowed for harder working farmers to acquire more land over time, making it somewhat of a meritocratic system. By the time of the communist revolution, the most successful of the Russian farmers under the Stiopian system were considered the kulaks, and were labeled as class traders by the government. In Everyday Stalinism, Ordinary Life in Extraordinary Times, Sheila Fitzpatrick wrote that the Soviet regime was adept at creating its own enemies, whom it then suspected of conspiracy against the state. It did so first by declaring that all members of certain social classes and estates, primarily former nobles, members of the bourgeoisie, priests, and kulaks, were by definition class enemies, resentful of their loss of privilege, and likely to engage in counter-revolutionary conspiracy to recover them. Fitzpatrick came to this conclusion primarily through Lenin's own words, who said in a speech in August of 1918, the Kulaks are rabid foes of the Soviet government. Either the Kulaks massacre vast number of workers, or the workers ruthlessly suppress the revolts of the predatory Kulak minority of the people against the working people's government. There can be no middle course. Peace is out of the question. Even if they have quarreled, the Kulak can easily come to terms with the landowner, the Tsar and the priest, but with the working class, never. The class conscious workers program is the closest alliance and complete unity with the poor peasants, concessions to and agreement with the middle peasants, and ruthless suppression of the Kulaks, those bloodsuckers, vampires, plunderers of the people and profiteers who batten on famine. Robert Conquest's book of the Dekulakization of Ukraine, The Harvest of Sorrow, details that during this summer of 1918, the Red Army poured out of the cities and into the countryside in order to begin the collectivization process of all the farmland, and began to seize grain for transport into the urban centers. Conquest wrote, The land of the landlords has been spontaneously seized by the peasants in 1917-18. to A small class of richer peasants, with around 50 to 80 acres, had then been expropriated by the Bolsheviks. Thereafter, a Marxist conception of class struggle led to an almost totally imagined imaginary class categorization being inflicted in the villages, where peasants with a couple of cows or five or six acres more than their neighbors were now being labeled as kulaks, and a class war against them was being declared. Who was actually a kulak was not based on any sort of subjective criteria, despite the government's efforts. In essence, you were a kulak based on the arbitrary conception of whatever red guard you happened to bump into who thought you might have too much stuff. And if somebody in your village hated you, all they had to do was tell a red guard that you were a kulak. This resulted in a large-scale revolt against Soviet rule, in response to which Lenin's famous hanging order was declared. Hang without fail, so the people see no fewer than 100 known kulaks, rich men, bloodsuckers. Do it in such a way that for hundreds of kilometers around, the people will see, tremble, know, shout. They are strangling and will strangle to death the bloodsucker kulaks. By 1929, collectivization was well underway. By this point, anyone who had used hired labor, owned a mill, owned a creamery, owned other equivalent farm processing equipment, owned any complex machine with a motor, or who had rented any such facility or machine, or who had traded their produce, lent their money, or engaged in any other form of non-labor income, was considered a kulak by the government. Stalin finally ordered the liquidation of the kulaks as a class. This actually didn't initially mean killing them, but instead seizing their land and their produce, dispersing them from their organizations and ties with each other, and as isolated individuals, folding them into the collectivized farm system. In response to this, the kulaks destroyed their own farms and butchered all of their livestock, rather than letting them fall into Soviet hands. They did manage to eat or trade some of their produce, but a lot of it was simply lost. It was at this point that Stalin actually had them purged. Without the kulaks and their produce, the Soviet agricultural sector lacked both the expertise and the materials necessary to create food, leading to the Soviet famine of 1932-33. The Red Army during this famine plundered the Ukrainian countryside to keep the Russian cities fed, leading to what is considered a genocide of the Ukrainian people. In my opinion, the reason that this always seems to happen to farmers isn't solely because the government's stability relies on them bringing food to market, though that's part of it. But it's also because the farmers, at least partially, exist outside of a system of government control. 
Yes, there are farm subsidies. Governments do like to buy the loyalty of farmers, but that's about the only lever of power that they actually have. Imagine you're a bug-eating, pod-dwelling, soy-sipping city worker. Your lifestyle requires that the supply chain keep bringing food into the city. No farms, no food, and you can't live the way that you do. Now imagine that you're living in a mining town or a woodmill town, some other form of production that is important, some other way of living that is not a city, but it's still not related to food. Even though you're doing meaningful labor, you still ultimately rely on the local farm to feed you. You simply trade your labor for theirs. In both cases, the government can tweak your behavior through incentives by managing the supply chain. That can't be done with farmers. You can't withhold food from people who produce it unless you're willing to point guns at them like the Soviets did, and we saw how that ended up. This is one of the great contradictions of socialism. You will often hear these two talking points come out of the mouth of any socialist. One, the workers should own their own labor. Two, that food is a human right. These are mutually exclusive. Farmers are workers. If a farmer owns his labor, then he owns the food it produces. That's his tools, his materials, his capital, his labor. So the product of it, the food, that's his too. But if food is a human right, then the farmer does not actually own his labor, the people do. The people have a right to the farmer's food, the farmer's labor. And for him to exert his own ownership, he necessarily has to violate the rights of other people under any socialist framework. When these two statements come into conflict, and they always do, time and again, the socialist rejects the worker should own his labor, for food is a human right. The Soviets did not consider the kulaks to own their own labor. Instead, the people owned it. And that sentiment is expressed in modern times, thankfully without the backing of state force, when socialists claim that farmers, or truckers, should not be allowed to protest, and that instead have to get back to work to keep producing the products that the cities have a right to. But it's all sleight of hand in the end. If you find that rare, honest socialist, he will tell you that a worker doesn't really have a right to his own labor under their system, rather that workers as a class have a right to their collective labor. Under a socialist framework, you as an individual don't have the right to exclusively own your own labor, as in you and only you own it. There's no standing apart from the collective in their system. Only workers as a class have a right to their labor, which means that workers of a class have a right to your labor. And if you deny other people your labor, you are violating their rights. Even for all the faults with the India example that I talked about earlier, the fact that Modi was right-leaning at least led him to attempt to liberalize rather than socialize his market, and also led him to ultimately back down when he figured out that his reforms were deeply unpopular. Meanwhile, in the Netherlands, this has been going on for three years. Mismanagement in Sri Lanka for over 10. And the Soviets created one of the great bloodbaths of human history. All because of the natural human impulse of productive people to individually, exclusively, own and control that which they create and how centralized systems of power tend not to be able to tolerate this individualistic impulse. The reason the left hates working class protests like these farmer strikes is because it puts on display for all to see the hypocrisy and subversion of socialism. 